Welcome back to Stribling's New York. I'm your host, Rob Taub, here at 710 AM, WOR Radio, on your digital dial and iHeart Media Company. Joe Nocera is our guest today, and he is a, a, a great columnist, author, uh, he's written many books, he's written for Newsweek, Esquire, of course, the New York Times, Fortune, GQ, Texas Monthly. Uh, he has won three Gerald Loeb Awards, and if I continued with reading his entire resume and CV, it would take the rest of the 21 minutes we have, so instead, I'm going to talk to him about his book, Indentured, The Inside Story of the Rebellion Against the NCAA. Welcome, Joe. Thanks very much. You know what people say when they see my resume? Tell guy, me. Guy can't hold a, guy just can't hold a job. <laughs> well, it's 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 varied and we call it a storied resume. Yeah. You've really uh and you, you've had quite a career. Thank you very much. So, when we were in the green room before eating dining on all the fabulous shrimp cocktail and lobster bisque and everything, we were talking about the NCAA and I asked you if you were going to go to the tournament or are you going to watch and you said yes. I uh, I sure am. I actually am going to go to the final four. That's one of the perks of being a sports writer or being in the sports department now. Um, but absolutely, I'm going to watch. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, you know, the Providence College Friars were the only game in town. Uh, they were great uh, in certain certain eras. It was it was it gave the town a lift. It, it, it created pride. It was wonderful basketball. I love basketball, and uh, I'll be watching the tournament. But you know, I I watch it. Uh, there's a part of my brain that still thinks, you know. These guys are being exploited, which is the essence of my case against the NCAA. Well, I've written a lot about sports myself, and a few years ago, I was covering the Sweet 16, and uh, Ohio State had played Syracuse, and I was in the Ohio State locker room, and uh, my photographer mentioned your name and said, look at this. You know, this is what Joe Nocera is talking about. And there were players in there that are not going to go to the NBA, not going to graduate. Three of them were there with their kids, and I don't mm. even think that these kids who had kids were 20 years old. And right. uh, it it was disturbing. Yet, of course, I didn't write about that. Right. And most other sports writers don't. Well, that's starting to change, actually. Um, you know, I think that for many decades, not just years, decades, um, Sports writers just naturally assumed that the NCAA wore the white hats and anybody they were going after wore the black hats. And uh, they also generally assumed, uh, or they didn't assume, they didn't think about what kind of deal the athletes were getting um, in return for putting their bodies on the line and generating, by the way, billions of dollars for everybody else, all the adults in the system. Now there's a lot more skepticism in the sports writing community and in the sports columnist community. And you see guys like Dennis Dodd and John Solomon at CBSSports.com, Patrick Ruby, who writes for Vice. You, you, you see a higher level of skepticism. And you also see people like Charlie Pierce, long, long, long-time sports writer, among other things, who had been saying this stuff for a long time, suddenly having a lot more visibility on the issue. So... Um, there's definitely change in the way the sports community looks at this, the, and the set of issues around the NCAA. Well, uh, something I mention frequently on this show, I've, I've had a pretty eclectic career myself. And uh, at one point I was working, well, that's, this is not in sports, I worked for World Wrestling Entertainment. And I was the supervising producer for all of the shows. And they had a lot of really great NCAA athletes, many who played professional ball but they were the 12th man on the team right. they were injured there the, this is also 15 20 years ago they were making 150 grand a year minimum salary and they they became wrestlers and we'd play a little basketball and i would watch these guys and go my god you know these are uh, are comparatively the dregs of the nba and at that point maybe there were 10,000 college basketball players and 500 players in the NBA right. so what's what's the disparity like and also this the disparity of money i think too many people think about well these kids get scholarships so they're getting right. 60 grand a year free well uh it's not you, free okay you've just asked about six different things but let me see yeah. if i can let me see if i can break so it we down. can go down the category yeah. categorically so, so number 1 um 5% or, of less or less of football players and men's basketball players become professional, 
okay? And uh, the number who become superstars and make a ton of money is even, and even smaller. So that means 95% of the athletes who suit up for big-time college football and basketball will never be professional athletes. Uh, so the question is, what happens to them? Uh, the bargain the university makes is that we'll give you an education in return for you being on the football team, generating revenue for us, creating excitement for our university and our fans and our alumni and our donors, and so on. It's a corrupt bargain. Uh, most of the athletes, many of the athletes, too many of the athletes don't get that education they're promised. They major in eligibility, and you know what that means, right? They just take whatever class the academic coordinators tell them to take so they can stay on the court. Um, there have been terrible scandals like the one at North Carolina where they had fake classes. I mean, what kind of an education is that? Uh, so they don't get the better life that they're promised. Um, they don't get the education that they're promised, and they don't get money, uh, which is, they, which is, you know, Mike Krzyzewski's making $10 million at Duke. Nick Saban's making $7.3 million at Alabama. His defensive coordinator is making $1.5 million. Jim Delaney, the conference commissioner of the Big Ten, is making $3 million. Jim Harbaugh, the coach of Michigan, is making $5 million. And you tell me the players don't, shouldn't get any of that? I find that, um, I find that offensive, actually. Well, there, you've, you've not just complained about it. You've come up with alternatives as well. <laughs> I have. And, and that's what I've always been impressed about. So uh, tell me about some of those, those ideas that you've had. Okay, so before. I have a series of ideas. First of all, as a, ma as a matter of morality, morality, universities should... Uh, offer lifetime health insurance and lifetime scholarships to all, to all their football and men's basketball players. Period. End of story. Um, secondly, um, I, I believe that there should be, I, I believe that the Olympic model should exist for all athletes, not just football and basketball. The Olympic model basically says you don't get paid for playing, for actually playing the game, but endorsements, signed autographs, sponsorships, anything like that is fine. So if the Connecticut women's basketball team, if the local auto dealer wants to have the whole team come in and do an auto ad, why not? I mean, really, why not? Why is that so terrible? For football and men's basketball, where they really are employees and where their job is to put in 50 to 60 hours on their sport, and more than that, to generate the billions of dollars that create this entertainment complex called college sports, they should get paid. So uh, there's a variety of ways to do it. One is that the NCAA should just get out of the compensation business and let the conferences do it. Let SEC compete with the Big Ten, compete with the Pac-12 uh, on issues of money. Maybe one guy want, uh, wants to pay one thing, somebody else wants to pay the other. You know, let the market work it out, basically. Well, what got, let's talk about money because comparatively, the NCAA, they have far less games, so they still make almost NBA kind of money. Uh, you you mean the you mean college sports college sports in, as a in, whole in, as a whole yeah they do that when you take all of college sports together and I'm including baseball hockey tennis everything when you take it all together it's a 13 billion dollar business it's the same as the NFL basically um, the sports that drive revenue of course are football and basketball um, you know the if if uh, if a college football player got paid percentage wise what a pro player would get he'd get you get a couple hundred thousand dollars. Now, I'm not suggesting that they should get that much, uh, only because I worry about what that would do to athletic departments. Couldn't it be put in trust later? Sure. And, there, you know, the, the judge in the O'Bannon case, you know, that's, that's the case that actually may go to the Supreme Court. Uh, she had a $5,000 trust fund. It's not very much, but she had a $5,000 trust fund as part of her remedies. The Court of Appeals amazingly took that away even as it ruled that the NCAA amateurism rules violated the laws of our nation. <laughs> uh, they said, you know, the rules are against the law, but, you know, we're really, we're going to allow them to, to continue to exist for whatever reason. Um, so a trust fund is a really good idea, I think. Um, but, you know, the way I would do it is I would give them some money while they're in school, you know, not a ton, maybe $25,000, $40,000 a year. I would actually use money. Uh, as a way to recruit, I think it would be, people have a really hard time thinking about this, but 
A, lots of students use money as a decision maker when they go to college. How big is my scholarship? Are they going to give me, am I going to get a job? What kind of job am I going to be able to, why, why can't athletes do that? Why is that so terrible? The second thing is if you had money on the table, it wouldn't be under the table. All this sleazy stuff would go away, or at least a lot of it would. Boosters wouldn't be, you know, uh, trying to pay, pay players, you know, in the locker room with, the, with, with what they call the golden handshake. Well, another thing you mentioned uh, in in your various books and, and writing has been uh, a six year plan for athletes. Right. I've, so, so I've changed my mind on that. I have you? Okay. So I've gone from my original plan was six years. That's right. So the idea was, you know, you finally become a junior and you realize I'm not going to be a pro. And my idea was that you get a little bit more time to graduate. I now think it should be a lifetime scholarship. I I think that athletes should take. I think the essence of college sports is that you're rooting for somebody who goes to the school. I do believe that. I don't believe – the NCAA says if you, if you gave the players money, you'd wreck college sports. I don't believe that. I don't think fans care about money one way or the other. I do think they care whether they're students. So I would say instead of having to take a full load of classes on top of playing football, you take two courses, you know, just enough. And then when your playing days are over – you know, you could you, maybe you leave school and do something else for a while. Maybe you go into the pros for a while. Maybe you go into the D leagues and you know fool around there for a while. But at, at the point at which you want to go back to school or you want to continue your education, the school owes you that. What, and you, what kind of money would it cost the schools to to implement any of these things? Well, um, or would we want to not look at it per school? Sure, no, 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 no. Sure, CAA? no, no, no. Don't look at it. You do have to look at it per school because that's where the money is going to come from. Well, I, mean, I wondered. Okay, when like I grew up watching a lot of Notre Dame football. That was back when you know sure. you had a few powerhouse teams because there was no cable and there was no satellite. Right. And I know Notre Dame would make absolute fortunes for one bowl game or even even a home game that was. What, I mean, no, Notre Dame was. It's not. Uh, Texas has this now, but Notre Dame for many, many years was the only individual school that had its own television football contract, uh, which is a lot of money. They've been with NBC since 1980, since about since the early 90s. Um, so, yeah, they have tons of money. I mean, why do these coaches get so much money? Why do they build these giant facilities, uh, indoor you know, football practice facilities? Why do they do that? Because there's so much money floating in the system, it has to go somewhere. And they're not profit-making institutions. So, you know, if you paid the players uh, uh, $40,000 a year, maybe Mike Krzyzewski would only make $9 million instead of $10 million. I, you know, So it's not creating a huge disparity. It's not like Mike Krzyzewski suddenly going to the poorhouse. Right. So the disparity would be, uh, it wouldn't be between Duke and Alabama. It would be between Duke and Wayne State. Okay, and I'm okay with that because my view is that um, universities, I mean, this is sort of the heart of the problem. Universities are very ill-equipped to run a giant American entertainment complex, which is what college sports is. They, they really, they, they, you know, they're in the business. They're kind of they're stuck with it. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people like it. But ultimately, I mean, let's be honest, there are at most – 80 universities that can run a big-time football program. There's probably 150, maybe a little more, who can run a big-time basketball program. And the rest have to kind of rethink the model. Okay, Wayne State can't pay the players. They can't afford it. That's fine. Wayne State goes into what used to be called Division I AA, or they don't pay the basketball players. You would still have upsets in the um, – uh, in March Madness, just as, by the way, the Americans won't beat the Russians in hockey – you know, the unpaid right. versus the paid, you'd still have the upsets. Maybe not as many, but, you know, when you get to the final four now or even the six, six, Sweet 16, how many uh, uh, of these smaller teams get in? Not that many. Very few. There's a Butler once in a while. There's a Wichita State. But Wichita State actually has a pretty big basketball program. It, it's pretty infrequent, and most of the upsets are in the second and third round. And... Um, that would continue. You, you wouldn't change the magic of March Madness by having this disparity between the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots would just kind of accept the fact that they're have-nots, and they would maybe put sports in a better perspective as part of university life. Well, I was at a, I covered a number of games at Camp Randall at a University of Wisconsin-Madison 
I mean, and the facility they have is unbelievable. It and is. Their, their basketball arena is amazing. It's pristine. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I would say uh, covering the Sweet 16 in Boston a number of years ago, uh, they feted the sports writers. I mean, we were treated like kings and ate really well. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's the most important thing to me. And, and I had a nice seat on the floor. But it's – it. You know, you'd see the kind of money coming in, and uh, it it doesn't look like it would affect them one way or another. And maybe it would make things better. Right. So there's two things about that. One is that uh, college sports is professionalized in every way except the players. And uh, the NCAA not only accepts this, but actually embraces it through the phrase the collegiate model, which really basically says you can maximize revenues as much as you want. You can pay everybody as much as you want, but the players have to remain unpaid. So the second aspect is, though, you know, what is the purpose of the $25 million indoor practice facility for the football team? Well, yeah, it is partly so you have an indoor practice facility, but it's also because you want to dazzle recruits. You want them to come to your place and say, oh, my God, this is so amazing. I got to be here. Wow, wow, wow. You know, you'd save a lot of money if you spend a little (laughs) if you use the money to actually get the recruits to hire the recruits. You know, Rather than on right. the facility. Um, the Ritz-Carlton doesn't have bathrooms like Camp Randall does. Yeah. I mean, or, or, or have, you ever, have you ever seen the football facility in uh, Eugene, Oregon that Phil Knight built? Yes. It, 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 is, it, is, it is much plusher, actually, than the Four Seasons. I'm sure. I, I, I've been wowed by, you know, all of these places, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. So you mentioned the Olympic model earlier, and, I mean, the Olympics were – it, it was horrible, and it's become better for all the athletes, right. for the competition. We have better Olympics now. Right. We have better so, runners, athletes. So why why can't the NCAA f- figure that out? Well, I think it's for the same reason that people were so fearful of Major League Baseball's free agency, and they were so fearful that the Olympics would be destroyed if money was induced. It, it, it's – they don't the – un, it's the unknown, number one. It's the unknown. And, um, you know, there was the same kind of fear. Players are greedy for Major League Baseball when, when Marvin Miller was trying to do his thing and, and, and get free agency. And it turned out great. Um, and the same thing would happen in, in college sports. Um, you know, why would you give this up if you're the NCAA if you don't have to? Why, if you have a free labor force, why would you start paying them if you didn't have to, right? But if you got to the point where you were paying players something, the sky would not fall. It would be fine, and everybody would adjust to it. Yeah, this isn't even as good for the players as 40 acres and a mule. Oh, they, really, <laughs> they are indentured servants. So we have two minutes left. So have you, have you in the book, is there a solution to all of this? No, the book, just, uh, the book is really a, a, a tale of this motley crew of people like Sonny Vaccaro, the former shoe mar- marketer who devoted his life to fighting the NCAA, some economists, some lawyers, um, a guy who ran a, an association for college athletes who tried to organize the Northwestern football team. It's about how these guys took on the NCAA. So it, the, the book is really storytelling, and inserted in between every chapter is a vignette of some horrible thing the NCAA has done to a player or a coach over the years that will just make your blood boil. Well, you know, we talk about change in New York on this show all the time. It's like I'll say, you know, I lived on the Upper West Side 37 years ago, and then it seems like one day, boom, all of a sudden it was this beautiful place after it was a dump up on 110th Street. Is in, And I know that didn't happen with the Olympics, but what is there a time progression we're going to see with the NCAA? Well, going to change uh, okay, over 10 years? Here's what we're, we're living through an era right now that's going to decide whether the NCAA is going to change or not. We will know in five years whether it's going to change or whether it's going to be the same forever. Will the NCAA get an antitrust exemption from Congress, for instance, that would allow the status quo? Will the courts ultimately shut down the efforts to free the players? You know, it, it, we're in this unknown time, and, and I really don't know the answer to that. Oh, it's it's interesting. I mean, you know, the obsession with college basketball, you have the president of the United States for the past seven years has come on national television on ESPN with his bracket, which are always very conservative. And that's why he always loses, because he just doesn't have enough uh, uh, upsets. 
Uh, how close do you come? Do you, do you have your own bracket? I don't do brackets anymore because I actually want to just enjoy the games, and, and having a bracket uh, uh, causes me to root for or against teams that I don't either don't care about or don't want to root for. I have usually fail miserably every time right. I've attempted a bracket, right. and I I do like Duke because I've I've covered them so many times, right. and I wrote an article about tenting and the Cameron crazies right. and uh, – my, found that whole thing interesting. Oh, we're getting our music, which means 21 minutes with Joe Nocera has flown by. And uh, I urge everybody to read this book, Indentured, The Inside Story of the Rebellion Against the NCAA by Joe Nocera of the New York Times. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm Rob Taub. You're listening to Stribblings New York, WOR AM Radio, 710 on your digital dial. Good night.